Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. Burundi's longtime ruler, Pierre Nkurunziza, died suddenly on June 8th, quite possibly from COVID-19. Nkurunziza had been president of Burundi since 2005, and in recent years, his rule became firmly authoritarian. His death sent shockwaves across Africa and the world. In May this year, for reasons we discuss in this episode, Nkrenziza decided to step aside and allow elections for his replacement. Not surprisingly, a member of his ruling clique won. After Nkrenziza's death, the constitution was bent to allow for the swift inauguration of his replacement just days later. Needless to say, this is a potentially very significant time and turning point in Burundi's modern history. On the line to discuss the legacy of Pierre Nkurunziza and what this chaotic moment means for Burundi and the surrounding region is Yolande Buka, who is a professor of political studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. We kick off discussing the circumstances surrounding Nkurunziza's death, which strongly suggest he died of COVID-19, which would make him the first sitting ruler to succumb to the virus. We then discuss his fraught time in power, including a key moment in 2015 when he engineered for himself a constitutionally dubious third term in office and survived a coup attempt. The conflict surrounding that episode led to the displacement of 400,000 people, the impact of which is still being felt across the region today. We also discuss the background of the new president of Burundi, Everest Dayashmia, and what his role may bring for the country. I think you'll find this episode helpful and interesting, and I'm glad to bring it to you. Burundi is a country that I have revisited from time to time on the podcast, owing largely to the chaos surrounding that episode in 2015. And today's episode is supported in part from a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York to showcase African voices in peace and security issues. To view other episodes in the series, please visit globaldispatchespodcast.com. And a big thank you to those of you who are emailing me to suggest topics I should cover or people I should interview. You know, the community that has formed around this show is largely, though not exclusively, people who are professionally engaged in foreign policy issues. So I really appreciate it when you reach out to me to let me know what's going on in your corner of the foreign policy and international affairs world. It helps me and it helps me bring your stories to everyone else. So thank you. You can email me using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. All right, now here is my conversation with Yolande Buka, professor of political studies at Queen's University. Well, what we know is uh, first what's been officially announced by the government, which he had died of um, heart failure, you know, cardiac arrest. What we also know, however, is that his spouse um, was airlifted to uh, Nairobi because she had COVID-19. She had contracted COVID-19. She sent a message to the population shortly after her, her husband's passing uh, to reassure the population that she was on demand. So what we know is that he, the president and Kunziza died of the cardiac arrest that his partner, his wife had COVID-19. And we also know from, we've all been reading about the symptoms and how the disease manifests itself in diff- various people. President Krunziza is relatively young. He was also an athlete. He was an avid soccer player. Um, so it kind of fits very well into the age group of, of, uh, that he fit in of, you know, the, the disease manifesting itself. Um, as uh, cardiac issues. So we are speculating, but, you know, based on the official 
government um, messaging. It's a cardiac arrest, but we also know the relationship with COVID. There's a lot of speculation and even some reporting that that sort of seems to present it as definitive that he died of COVID-19. He was something like 55 years old, and as you mm-hmm. said, a very sort of avid athlete. Yes. And now a, a report I read you know, before we spoke was kind of fears among the ruling elite that he might have been a super spreader. It's very possible. I mean, the, the challenge, I mean, we, we know that recently the WHO had been expelled from Burundi. Um, and some of the concerns that they were uh, voicing was the ways in which the government was failing to respond robustly with uh, what they, you know, they argued was an increasing number of people infected and the lack of, of response from the government. Um, and that also could be at play here in terms of the maybe not wanting to have an official uh, statement about uh, the president having the disease, uh, possibly passing it on to the inner circle of, of the executive at the time. We are not sure about the health status of various members of um, people in, in, in the cabinet. So that could be a concern. We know that nobody's immune from or protected from the, this disease. The prime minister of, of Great Britain had it, um, you know, was followed very closely. So we know that uh, given the proximity that he had, obviously, to his spouse and the other members of his cabinet, we don't know who could have the disease and the concerns that they have may be justified. And, and yeah, I mean, it's worth emphasizing, you know, how much the ruling elite would have to lose if they did, you know, confirm that it was COVID-19 that killed him. As you said, you know, like many authoritarians, he downplayed and denied the impact of COVID-19 in Absolutely. Burundi and didn't, didn't do any shutdowns, eventually kicked out the WHO for raising concerns. And so it just kind of looked bad Absolutely. If, uh, if indeed he died of COVID-19. Um, so I just want to um, maybe have you explain, you know, who was... Pierre Nkurunziza. He was a singularly important, uh, significant figure in the recent history of Burundi. How did he come to power? Well, Pierre Nkurunziza uh, fought uh, for uh, during the Civil War. So he's somebody who came in uh, relatively early in our contemporary uh, understanding or, you know, kind of following of, of, of the Burundi situation. Uh, Pierre Nkurunziza wasn't didn't begin his position in the uh, CNDD, FDD, or the National Council for the Defense and Democracy Forces. That's the, of, the ruling party. That, yeah, the, that the, the ruling party. force that then became the ruling party. Exactly. So he didn't start as a very high ranking of the party, but made his way up through the ranks during the Civil War. Um, and he was among those who um, didn't believe that uh, going to the negotiation table at the time uh, where Uprona, who was the ruling party at the time, a Tutsi-led ruling party um, in Burundi, uh, Pren Kurunziza was among those who did not believe that um, they needed to negotiate uh, with Uprona. So they came relatively late into the negotiation process. But early enough to be able to capitalize um, on the opening of the political space and allowing them to successfully secure the first democratically held elections in, in Burundi. So um, he's somebody who is, is known to have been very religious. Um, he was also somebody who... Um, you know, really valued uh, military experience as a prerequisite to for the leadership of the party, and he was not the only one. Um, and initially, uh, he made a lot of promises about um, what his party could provide to the population, uh, democracy in the country, provision of social services. In fact, within a few years of him being in office, um, they provided free education for primary school, um, free maternal care and, and, and health care for children under five. Uh, that did not, however, come with consultation and the type of plan that would allow, you know, civil servants and the bureaucracy to figure out how to provide those services, uh, how to increase a, a budget to provide these services. And over time, these promises um, ended up being less of a quality that people expected. So ultimately, his presidency um, 
his legacy is kind of a mix of, you know, all the things that he promised, his proximity to the general population, but also failed uh, social economic policies. You know, it seems like many leaders of that ilk that came to power following a sort of a, a war, a civil war, you know, early on, he did sort of deliver on some of his promises, but then the appeal of authoritarianism uh, sort of began more and more apparent the longer he stayed on. Um, can it seems one of the key inflection points in this story is the 2015 election. Uh, can you just sort of describe the what led to uh, his decision to seek a constitutionally dubious third term? And this got a lot of attention at the time. And I even did some podcast episodes about it at, at the time. Um, but here we are five years later, and I'm wondering how you think in retrospect that decision was made and the ultimate impact of that decision. Well, I actually am one of this maybe smaller school that believe that we should actually backtrack a little bit before 2015 and look at 2010. Um, and I think, in, in, and I'll answer your question by saying that the 2015 elections to me was a consequences of 2010 and how uh, the region responded to 2010, the 2010 elections, and the international community. Um, so explain, because I know nothing of the 2010 elections. So the 2010 elections were actually marred with a, a tremendous amount of violence and repression. So what we see in, um, in you know, after he comes to power in, in, in 2005 is kind of this promise of, 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 of democracy, um, new institution, the Arusha Peace Agreement, where regional actors like South Africa, uh, Tanzania, the international community had come together to figure out how best to usher in uh, a democratic consolidation in Burundi through power sharing and so forth. What you see in 2005, between 2005 and 2010, is a very rapid clamping of the political space. 2010 kind of becomes this testing ground, real, you know, uh, universal suffrage uh, to confirm the CNDD, FDD's um, legitimacy and power. And you also have the entry of the FNL, which was one of the last armed groups that came in a little bit too late into the political sphere, you know, trying to transfer its position from an armed group into a political opposition party. And they were trying to make their way. And, and I should mention that the FNL was um, Agaton Rwasa, who is one of the opposition members currently in the political landscape in Burundi. He was the I head. Like we'll, we'll come back to him. Yes. In a, we'll come to him in a moment. I believe. So yes. he was entering kind of this, 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 um, this kind of political competition. He agreed to, you know, lay down the weapons and enter the political space. And he had a certain degree of success and, and support from the population, particularly around Burundi. What we see in 2010 is a severe repression of the opposition. And the FNL, which was a Hutu-led party at the time, predominantly Hutu party, uh, kind of could have acted as a party that would challenge the CNDD FDD. And they bore the brunt of government repression, the intelligence services, youth militias. Uh, and this has been documented by Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the United Nations issued a report on this type of cramping down. And Instead of um, kind of having the international community, or at least the very regional partners, huh? and I think that's more important than maybe the UN or others, but South Africa, the African Union, and other who were guarantors of the Arusha Agreement, kind of pay attention um, and and maybe you know put some pressure to ensure a democratic process. People kind of laid back because they said, "Well, Burundi is kind of our success story here." Um, and there may be a little bit of violence, but things will normalize with time. When you open that space for this type of, I think, roll back into authoritarianism, it's very difficult to clamp back up once 2015 happens. And I think to yeah. me, that was the, the starting point. 
Yeah, well, it seems as you describe it, their assumption that things would normalize was exactly wrong. Things got more and more authoritarian, and the space for civil society and opposition got smaller and smaller to the point in 2015 when Nkurunziza opted to run for a third term yes. of dubious constitutionality, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is that in addition to what happened before, what we weren't paying attention to was dissent within the CNDD FDD, right? So this kind of realization that even within the party, if we remember the coup attempt in 2015 was orchestrated by a former member of the party. Um, so when we understand that even within the CNDD FDD, there were people who were saying, look, you serve your two terms. It's time for others. And there were, there was very little doubt that despite the decrease in popularity of the ruling party, the party would still manage to gain uh, the majority of the seats in parliament. Um, and the, the sense was within the, the, the ruling party, the sense that there needed to be a rotation. Um, he could not, he could not stay in power forever at the head of the, of the party. And that also is something that the international community missed. And, and so, you know, in 2015, um, while he was abroad, I think he was in Tanzania or something, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, there, there was a coup attempt. Yes. Um, and this was in the process of Nkurunziza claiming that third term. Uh, the coup attempt was somewhat short lived, uh, but, uh, it, caused massive displacement that this were fighting around it um something like nearly what's something like 300,000 people 400, almost 400,000 400,000 people mm -hmm. were displaced um many made refugees um so it was a very violent violent time yes um was. and and an unsettling time and it was also around this time that the international community seemed to start to abandon him as well seeing in Kurenziza for the kind of authoritarian he he was and all the clampdowns on civil society and the rest of opposition forces and he seemed to lose a lot of his foreign support yes and and i think this type of um uh, withdrawal of support started even before um the crisis in may of 2015 uh, there were tension between the special representative that was appointed for the great lakes region um in bujumbura uh, there were tensions between him. The capital, we should say. Yes, yeah. Bujumbura is the capital of Burundi. So the African Union had a special representative for the Great Lakes region that was stationed in Burundi. And there were tensions between that representative and the ruling party. Uh, you know, the, the AU representative was really making the point of trying to encourage the ruling party to proceed with the 2015 elections with as much openness and transparency as possible to rein in, um, some of the young members of the party called the Imborena Kure, who were rumored to be, um, uh, intimidating members of the opposition and a general population. And, the, the special representative ended up being kicked out of the country. Um, and that was well before the election, a few months before the election. So what we see is even ahead of the coup attempt or President Nkurunziza's candidacy, members of the region were trying to encourage him to relinquish power because at the end of the second term, he was constitutionally supposed to leave office. But the coup attempt, even before the coup attempt, the crisis, the protest that took place and the violence of the repression of the protest um, were actually the turning point for the African Union, where they openly criticized President Nkurunziza and the government. And then that's when the, the tensions between Rwanda and Burundi became more palpable as well, because the, Buru the Rwandan government made very uh, open comments about whether or not Nkurunziza should stay in office. You know, so he survives this uh, moment in 2015, entrenches himself in power. I'm curious to learn why it was that he decided to relinquish power this year. I mean, he could have, you know, done more constitutional shenanigans and stayed in power for much longer if he wanted to. Yet, uh, I was really surprised to to see that he, in fact, decided to step down and uh, let a successor run for uh, election. Well, and that goes back again to paying attention to the internal dynamics within the ruling party, the ruling party. I think, um, 
what we fail to appreciate uh, when we are outside observers is that ruling parties, opposition parties, opposition coalitions are not monolith. They're not kind of this unitary actor that acts together all the time. Within those parties, there are people who are vying for power. There are people who are biding their time. There are people who are supporting the ruling elite within the party, and there are others who are against it. And in the case of Burundi, you had already a division between the civilians, those who never fought in the bush for this during the civil war and those who had military experience and served. So that was already, and still is a kind of a, a source of, of, of a potential fracture uh, or division within the party. But there was also people who, who felt that Nkrunziza uh, had served as a president long enough. And my understanding speaking to people who are better than w- way more knowledgeable than I am, but who are who are well plugged in into the political elite in Bunjubura, make it clear that President Kurunziza didn't have that much of a choice within the party. There were demands about him stepping down, and he even had difficulties uh, naming his successors. And ultimately, uh, Daishimiye ended up being somebody who was a a, a good compromise. Um, that he didn't necessarily uh, favored in the, at the end of the day. And, and, and you're referencing Evariste Daishmiye, who is the new president who, who won uh, elections. Yes. Um, but basically, you know, in Corinthians was given like a half a million dollar a year sinecure to yes. kind of fade away. Mm-hmm. Um, and these new elections happened in the midst of the pandemic mm-hmm. um, in which the opposition figure you referenced earlier ran against Daishmiya, uh, who you know was the ruling party favorite, who won, you know, in elections that were probably not free nor fair, but we won't really ever know because the government didn't allow any foreign observers in. Yeah. Um, so, I guess first, like, what do we know about this new ruler? How much? How more of the same can we expect? Well, this is the the big question mark. Um, one of the thing that. I see as an opportunity with a new presidency, no matter what party that person comes from, is an opportunity to mend bridges in the region. Um, At near the end of his presidency, President Kurunziza didn't necessarily make friends with people in, in, in Rwanda. We know that for sure. The relationship with Uganda uh, was good at one point, then soured through uh, the end of the previous crisis. Tanzania's relationship with Burundi were relatively good. And then there was a change in presidency in Tanzania. So I think with President Daishimiye, there is an opportunity to try to uh, change the foreign policy position of the country and try to reopen itself to the region and to the continent more broadly, and then to the international community at a later stage. The only kind of friends it seemed that Nkurunziza had left at the end were Russia and China. Yes. He'd, seemed, he'd seemingly alienated himself from most of the rest of the international community. Absolutely. And, and you know, we often see kind of the focus on the European Union because the European Union imposed sanctions and the United States. But I think within a region, you want to be at least in uh, amicable, have amicable relationships with your immediate neighbors. And Burundi wasn't, um, at least pre- under President Kurunziza, it wasn't necessarily the case. So I, I, there's an opportunity. At the same time, you know, President Daishimiye, you know, he's part of this kind of hardliners, um, people who supported the president's President Kurunziza's position um, throughout the crisis. Um, he's somebody who also facilitated, he was the head of the ruling party, so the, the secretary general of the CNDD, FDD. Um, uh, you know, if you look at his record, he had very harsh words to say against the opposition in exile, uh, you know, facilitated, um, helped or at least participated in the changes of the constitution in 2018. So the extent to which, uh, President Daishimiye has a completely different version or vision, I should say, of Burundi's future remains in question, but he definitely has an opportunity. So, so he comes from that same hardline faction that, for example, like supported the kind of crackdowns and closing of civil society space that Nkurunziza accelerated during his time in office. Absolutely, 
absolutely. And he served in the Civil War. So he, he, he rose through the rank during the Civil War. He presided, um, over some of the military activities, uh, during the Civil War. And that gained him an important seat, uh, in the decision maker of the ruling party by virtue of that military experience and that vision, uh, of Burundi and power in Burundi. So, so what opportunities exist for key diplomatic players, say, in the European Union, which you said has imposed sanctions on Burundi for its uh, human rights conduct and for its uh, election mal- electoral malfeasance? Um, you know, what can, say, the EU do to encourage a reopening of civil society? Well, that's been the question for the past five years. Um, and I'm not sure that I actually have an answer for um, foreign actors in Europe or North America. What I do think would be important would be for um, the East African community and the African Union um, to pay attention, because this is an opportunity where uh, the African Union failed to um, kind of push its way to uh, to influence the CNDFDD to hold democratic election in 2015 and in 2010. Can they reset their relationship with um, the new presidency, the new executive branch? That would be a good time to do so. We know that Burundi is also involved in Amazon. They are providing soldiers uh, in Somalia and recently had uh, a thousand of their troops sent home. The, you know, there's a lot of conversation about whether it was deliberate that it was the Burund- Burundian troops that got sent home or not. Um, but bottom line, we know that Burundi is still an important actor in the, the field of security in Somalia. Um, is that a way to open the, a, a more um, sustained dialogue? I'm not sure, but I think the region and the African Union should definitely try to find ways to um, open more conversations about the future of the country, not only in, for Burundi, but the future of its role in providing peace and secure, insecurity in the region. There is no mistake that the 2015 crisis, still, we're still feeling the effects. You, you had 400,000 refugees from the crisis. It, 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 it uh, decreased slightly. I think now you have about 300,000, but there's still being supported and taken care of by countries in the region. And I know for a fact that they would like to have the ability to send some of these refugees home. Uh, Lastly, in the coming days or weeks or months, um, what will you be looking for from Daishmia in terms of um, what will suggest to you how he will, how he will rule uh, as president Are there any sort of moments or decisions that you can see him making or key inflection points coming down the road that might suggest to you what his tenure in office might look like? Well, I think the first... The first sign has already passed, and that was um, the Constitutional Court uh, accelerating or kind of moving his inauguration forward despite clear constitutional provision about how a transfer of power should have taken place after the death of President Kurunziza. The extent to which, um, you know, the constitutional court, the petition to the constitutional court uh, was coming from his small inner circle or not is the, maybe a question mark. But for me, I see a lack of faith or at least a lack of true adherence to a document that was recently um, amended in 2018. So you kind of got the constitution you wanted and you're still moving the clock forward. And, and, and you're saying that, you know, uh, the death, the sudden death of Nkurunziza after an election, but before inauguration, mm-hmm. there are clear constitutional uh, provisions as to how, uh, what should happen in that case. But Ex- instead of following yes. those guidelines, they just accelerated the inauguration. Exactly. Of, so according to the constitution, yeah. uh, should the president, you know, die uh, suddenly or be unable to, uh, to, to rule, the president of the National Assembly, who's Pascal Nyabenda would have taken office, been acted, been would have been the acting president until new election. Now, this is where new elections would have taken place. And this is where there was a little bit of a gray area because you already had had elections and President Daishimiye had been elected. But for me, kind of this lack of 
okay, how do we still move with the spirit of the constitution and simply accelerating um, the inauguration? Maybe, and I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure here. Maybe an indication uh, that there will be a continuing of the bending of the rules in order to facilitate um, what the ruling elite wants. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Yolanda. This was very helpful. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you so much to Yolande. Thank you all for listening. And a disclaimer, the views expressed in this episode are those exclusively of those who expressed them. And, you know, Burundi is not one of those kind of stories that you hear or see much in the Western or mainstream press. I was very glad to have this in-depth conversation about this kind of pivotal moment in the recent history of the country and bring it to you. If you appreciate this kind of coverage, please do consider supporting the show by becoming a premium subscriber on Patreon. You can unlock dozens of bonus episodes and other rewards. Just go to patreon.com slash global dispatches. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support and we'll see you next time. Bye.